together for Kevin Lightsey. My father, Kirk Lightsey, was 19 years old when I was born in 56. And to support his family, my mother and I, he had two jobs. His day job was selling shoes at Richard's Cancellation Shoe Store on Broadway, right around the corner from J.L. Hudson's. My father sold shoes to some of the most powerful and stylish pimps and hoes in the city. My father's night job was playing piano at the Frolic Show Bar, which was down the street from the Flame and around the corner from Barry Gordy's record store. Not only was my father a fantastic piano player, he played piano since he was five years old. He was an excellent negotiator because one night at the Frolic Show Bar, two employees of one of the most dangerous pimps in the city came to my father during the break with a proposition. They proposed that my father be their new pimp. My father successfully convinced these two ladies that it would not be in their best interest or his, and that they should stay with their current management team. <laughs> now my mother, Marva, who was also 19 when I was born, did not quite agree with the hours that he kept or the company, because her father, Joseph Hunt, went to work in the morning, came home at night every day. And she, my, my mother was a very beautiful woman. She was one of the first black cheerleaders at Pershing High School. She studied ballet and modeling, and after two years, she wasn't having it. So they got a divorce. My mother and I moved back with her parents, Big Mama and Big Daddy, as we affectionately called them. And by the time I was five, my mother remarried to Sydney, who I call my math dad because Sydney had a degree in mathematics from Wayne State. And at the time they got married, my math dad was in Seattle programming missile guidance systems for Boeing. Shortly after they got married, he transferred back to Detroit, worked for Chrysler, where he programmed IBM mainframe computers before PCs and the such. He was one of the few black men in America to do so in the 60s. The only problem I had with my math dad, well, there were three. <laughs> the first is he followed the rules. So if we were cruising down the Lodge Freeway and the sign said 55, I guarantee you he wasn't doing 56 or 57, he wasn't doing 53 or 52, he was doing 55 on a dime. <laughs> the next issue I had with him, damn it, he kept us on a budget. <laughs> now what that meant for me is that the clothes that I got in September had to last me till June. <laughs> the problem was that I was growing fast, so by December, I was getting frostbite on my ankles. And by June, I might as well have been wearing capri pants. <laughs> his other issue, and this was a bad habit of his, the worst was his favorite word, and his favorite word was no. Can I have an extra dessert? No. 
can, can I stay up late? No. Can I? He would say no faster than I get the question out. Now, conversely, my music dad, who played the piano, and I saw him every other weekend, his favorite word was, wait for it, yes, <laughs> woo, can I, can, can I have an extra dessert, yes, can I stay up late, yes, by the time I was 12 years old, do you know when I asked my music dad, could he teach me how to drive? <laughs> Not yes. Heck, I was cruising down 12th Street driving the car. <laughs> it was wonderful. <laughs> now, fast forward to I'm 17, and I had just graduated from CAS. Now, oh, as a side note, both my math dad and my music dad graduated from CAS also. My mother shopped at the best husband high school. So when my mother and my math dad asked me what did I want to do for the summer, there was just one word. New York, because by now, my music dad was a hit. He was a jazz pianist in New York playing all of the best jazz clubs there. But that wasn't it for me. I was tired of the no's, and I wanted to get to the yeses. <laughs> it took my mother and my math dad two weeks to tell me I couldn't spend the summer in New York. But they told me I could spend a week. And that next week, I was on a plane to New York. And when the plane landed, the yeses started. <laughs> hey, Dad, can we go to Coney Island? Yes. Hey, can I stay up late? Yes. And then I asked them the most important question. I said, hey, Dad, can I go to all of the gigs with you this week? And he said, yes. <laughs> That's all he had to tell me. Because this particular week, he was playing at Bradley's. And Bradley's was one of the best jazz clubs in New York. Bradley's was so bad that limos would pull up to let the people out. And you could see the chauffeur standing by the cars. But that wasn't it for me. The reason it was good for me, and this is a secret, so don't, don't any of you tell this. <laughs> but you know how rock stars have groupies? Well, the secret is jazz stars have groupies too. But they're not the same groupies. The jazz club groupies were fine uh, on t gowns. Oh, if I thought the women at Cast Tech were beautiful, <laughs> whoo. <laughs> but my problem was that I looked like my music dad, kind of that Billy D. Williams look. And what would happen is the groupies would come to me to get to him. But my problem was I was raised by my math dad. I had zero game. And to make matters worse, I had lock jaw every time a beautiful woman came up to speak to me, to talk to him. <laughs> that was it. And unfortunately, there were a lot of beautiful women that came to me to talk to him. And after a week of being a deaf mute, <laughs> I decided 
I had enough. And that Friday, when we got up in the afternoon, I, I asked my dad, I said, hey, dad, can I hit the streets of New York, you know, by myself? Because, you know, I can do better on my own. <laughs> and he said, yes. <laughs> And that's all he had to tell me. I went straight to the bedroom. I got on my longest high water pants. You know, the plaid ones. And I put on my favorite striped shirt. I grabbed a pocket full of subway tokens and I hit the subway. Oh, I rode that subway from Queens to Harlem. But I had another problem. I look like Billy D. I dress like Urkel. <laughs> and I acted like Gomer Pyle. I was walking around New York saying, hey, howdy, hey. Those people looked at me like I was E.T. And they wanted E.T. to go home. And after six hours of being abused on the streets of New York, I agreed with them. E.T. had to go home. <laughs> so I got back on the subway to take the ride back to the... My father had a loft in Greenwich Village. He lived on the first, fourth floor. It was, it was huge. He had a grand piano in the loft. So I caught the subway going to the loft. And don't you know it, I got off at the wrong stop. <laughs> what made it worse is I was out of tokens. <laughs> so I'm wandering around. I'm about eight blocks away. And then I made my second mistake. I took a shortcut <laughs> down some side street. And that's when I heard it. As I was looking down at my feet, trying to orientate myself, I heard it. Click. Click. Click, 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 click. And when I looked up, there were two women standing in front of me. We'll call them chocolate and vanilla. <laughs> chocolate looked like Pam Greer from the movie Coffee. She had thigh high boots up to here that ended at hot pants that were so tight that I could read the words on the quarter in her pocket. She had a belly button so flat and a crop top that was full. <laughs> she had a fro down to her shoulders. She was fine. And her ver friend Vanilla, she looked like Peggy Lipton from my favorite program, The Mod Squad. <laughs> she had on patent leather pumps that legs that went up to a mini skirt that was so short that I was afraid to look at it too long for fear that I couldn't break the stair. <laughs> but the amazing thing is they were talking to me. Now, you'd think I went to Cass, all the beautiful women at Cass, but none of them talked to me because remember, I was the Urkel of Cass before Urkel. <laughs> so, if you're looking at me trying to figure out, did you know me at Cass? <laughs> Don't think too long, because you didn't. <laughs> but in any case, I had to look behind me to make sure that they were actually talking to me, because I wasn't used to that. But they were. The problem that I had, that my testosterone level had risen as high as the Empire State Building and the blood was rushing from my head down below my waist so fast I couldn't hear. <laughs> and
And vanilla was over here looking left to right. And chocolate was pointing at the door, that door over there, where that other couple just went in. And they were motioning. I couldn't hear them, but I, I could understand. <laughs> and with my mute self, I was, yes, please. So I followed their butts right to that door. And just like my math dad taught me, I opened the door for the ladies. <laughs> and when we stepped in, there was a long, dim hallway that looked like it went forever. And all I could remember was the faint click, click, click of Vanilla's high heel shoes as we walked down to the last door on the right. And when we got there, Chocolate knocked on the door three times. And somebody opened it, and we stepped in, and that's when I saw it. I saw the sign on the wall that said, the church of free love and happiness. <laughs> Not my grandmother's church, but I wanted to be a member. As I looked at the room, there were people sitting in folding chairs, and chocolate and vanilla marched me down the center, right to the front, reserved seating. And just as our butts hit, hit the chair, a preacher came out and he started preaching. And, and he was preaching, but I wasn't hearing. What I was doing was every time he did a crescendo in his speech, chocolate or vanilla would whisper in my ear. Don't know what they said, but the breath <laughs> on my ear caressed my ear. Oh. It was intoxicating. <laughs> Not only that, I smelled their perfume. You know, the finest French perfume that you can buy in Kmart. <laughs> and when he was finished talking, ch chocolate looked at me like I understood. I didn't. <laughs> I was just getting my hearing back. And she gave me a recap. She said, we want you, chocolate and vanilla, to go up north to the farm and live with us forever. The bus leaves at nine and it leaves on time. Do you want to come? And that's when it happened. That's when the words bubbled up from my stomach, up my throat, and I said, yes, yes, I want to move up north to the farm with chocolate and vanilla forever. <laughs> and they said, well, you got to go because you got to go home, get packed and get back because the bus leaves at nine and it leaves on time. So they walked me out to the sidewalk and that's when the next miracle happened. Vanilla reached up and hugged me. I still remember that in my dreams. And better than that, chocolate kissed me right here on my right cheek. I'm sorry, honey, now you understand why I'm a little more sensitive on this side. And they snapped me out of my reverie and they said, you got to go. And that's when I went into the man of action. I started running like I was OJ going through the airport. I ran so fast I got lost twice and still got there on time. When I got to the door, I pulled out my key, but my hand was shaking so bad I had to use two hands to unlock it. I unlocked that door. I flew up those four flights of stairs without my feet touching the floor. When I got upstairs, I unlocked that door. I came in and that's when I heard it. I heard my father playing the piano like, woo, he was in it. He was in it. And he didn't see me. 
I went right back to the bedroom. I pulled out my suitcase and I was packing clothes faster than anything. I was packing so many clothes, I was packing his clothes. <laughs> and then that's when I noticed the music stopped. And I looked up and my dad was looking down at me and he said, Kevin, where are you going? Your plane leaves on Sunday. This is Friday. And that's when I told him. I told him about chocolate and vanilla and going to the farm and living there forever with them. And that's when it happened. He looked down at me and he said the one word I had never heard him say in my entire life, he said, no. <laughs> and when I didn't move, he repeated it with a little bass in his voice, no. And when I still didn't move, he looked at me and said, Kevin, you better unpack that bag Get to the front door because you're not going to the farm with chocolate or vanilla or their cousin strawberry. <laughs> now move. I unpacked that bag faster than I packed it. There were clothes everywhere. I got to the door. He took me to the club. And you know what he did when we got to the club? He got a stool and he sat it between the drums and the piano. And all night, Either he had an eye on me or the drummer had an eye on me, but he never let sight of me. And when we got home that night, don't you know he took my key, locked all the four deadbolts, put the keys in his pajama pocket, and went to sleep. <laughs> that man never lost sight of me for two days until the plane took off for Detroit. And unfortunately, I never got to see chocolate or vanilla, or their cousin strawberry, ever again. But it did teach me an important lesson because I told this story to my father, my music dad who lives in Paris now, he's still playing jazz. And uh, he remembered. And he said that that no was the hardest no he had ever said because he was so afraid that it would affect our relationship. It didn't. But my children, unfortunately, <laughs> inherited my nose because my music dad reinforced it. And Ashley, Marcus, Lauren, and Shana are now better for it. They are professionals and doing the thing in life and have got me five grandchildren. <laughs> but I want to thank my math dad and my mother who have since passed. <laughs> For giving me the hundreds of no's that have made me who I am. And I want to thank my music dad for telling me the one no that made a difference. Thank you. Kevin Lightsey.